<clears throat> okay, so I just want to pref preface this uh, this session um, with not a warning, <laughs> warning is too strong a word, but with a comment that you know I am not a uh, like a, a, a academic an applied linguistic scholar. Okay, I don't research applied linguistics. Um, so my <laughs> sorry. So my role is as a teacher and a teaching fellow, and so in that respect, um, I try maybe like all, most of you try to engage with literature uh, and understand it in a, with a view to improving my practice. Um, so I don't spend hours and hours and hours researching, but I try to you know try to read up on things that I think would be useful. Uh, for my practice, which I'm sure why you are here as well, to try and, you know, just uh, ex extend your knowledge or review some ideas in order to, um, you know, be better teachers. So that's just a proviso, okay? <laughs> so pe some people here may have um, stronger backgrounds in this area. And so, like I said, this isn't targeted at, um, at a very uh, high level. It's more at a kind of a review of some concepts that I've found in useful for my practice or I think are interesting and maybe I've struggled with understanding sometimes. Um, um, but so feel free if people have more knowledge to share, um, please feel free to share your knowledge. Um, and if you feel there's something that you could explain uh, more clearly than me or that help clarify something, I think that would be really useful too. Um, so just in terms of what is discourse analysis, so I'm going with a very, uh, which is a very generic definition of discourse analysis uh, from an introductory textbook um, by Paltridge. Um, so that, and this definition kind of has two aspects. And so the first aspect is, it's a way of looking at language um, in its context. Uh, so the, it's language in use, uh, so not um, decontextualized language. And it tends to look at the second aspect, kind of stretches of text uh, language. And in that respect, it's kind of also concerned with how language is organized. So how people organize what they say. So that's the kind of my how I kind of conceptualize discourse from uh, a teaching point of view. And I know there are other more views of discourse and more social views and critical uh, theory views. Um, but just from a, from a practical point of view in terms of teaching, I just uh, like to think of it as the lang language is, as a product or as a close relationship with the context where the language is found. And then discourse also is concerned with how language is organized and structured. <clears throat> so um, the other, so discourse is a very broad area. So as you can see from some of the chapters in this introductory textbook of by Paltridge. And so we'll be covering all of these today. Okay. <laughs> no. So we'll be cover I'm just going to cover a few topics in this um, that uh, I have found useful um, in my teaching. Um, and I suppose, so most of my teaching of English has been English in an academic, for EAP, English for Academic Purposes context. Um, so I suppose my, my interest would be tends to be more on the written text side as, a, as opposed to spoken text. Um, but I think some of the concepts here are still also applicable uh, to, um, uh, to uh, spoken texts as well that I talk about. Um, the other thing, just in terms of um, talking about discourse, um, Paltridge has the, these concepts, the unity of structure and the unity of texture. Um, where structure is a little bit more focused on um, the how information is organized and the flow of information within a text. And then the unity of texture is those devices that kind of hold the text together. Uh, most of what I'm going to focus on um, 
tends to be a little bit more focused on the unity of structure concept today, um, rather than the things that to do with texture. Um, so that's just so this idea of things that may be how information is structured in text and how um, information is uh, how the, how people control the flow of information in text. All right, so with that, I am going to start off uh, by giving you um, a, a worksheet with three exercises on it. I, I'm going to put the worksheet, try, this should work, in the chat. Uh, if you just bear with me, will I open it? Uh, oh, well, that we won't be putting the worksheet in the chat. Can you just bear with me one second? Um, that wasn't where I, sorry, I just need to pull this worksheet up. It seems to have disappeared from where I had placed it. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, and get this. Back. Oh, yeah, that's why. Is it is. Um, okay, I'll just be one sec. Apologies for this. It should be there. Okay. Uh, I'll try this one more time. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've been teaching online. Most of my teaching is now face to face. I'm getting rusty. Here we go. Oh my gosh. If... So rusty. Okay. Mm. Sorry about this. It's trying to open documents that are. I have a, this document open. Okay. I think I should pause recording. <clears throat> and then for the second exercise, did you think that text B was better, easier to read? Okay, great. Um, would anybody like to just say what maybe concept uh, those exercises are illustrating? Yanni, you have you unmuted? I've just unmuted. Mm. Yeah. Would you like to? Well, I wonder if I stop let some oh, yeah. um, other attendees first. <clears throat> would anybody like to? Yeah, so it's about, um, I would say, coherence. Um, yeah. Great. And yeah. And Definitely. rhetorical structure. So, the which? Rhetorical structure as well, like yeah. basically coherence. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. That it's true. Anybody else? Yes. So, I think, yeah, it's an element um, that uh, will uh, help with coherence and with. The structure of the text, um, which is the concept of um, theme and theme and ream, mm. theme and ream. I don't know. Um, so I, I can't remember when I first heard about theme and ream. I think I was a few years into teaching before I came across it. I think I was doing my diploma in TESOL, and there was a module on discourse analysis, and I thought it was a, a fantastic concept, just in terms of. Uh, providing a solution to some of the types of problems uh, in the text that students produced. Um, so, so I think it's a really interesting and useful concept uh, to, uh, to, well, to know about and then to think about how you might, at some stage, think about how you might use it in, with students. Um, so the theme part is basically the um, part of the clause uh, which indicates what you're talking about. And, and so it's the point of departure that orients the reader to what they're going, information they're going to receive. And it generally should be some information that is already known 
to the reader or that they can comprehend quickly. Uh, in terms of grammar, it usually is the subject of the clause, and it usually is some sort of noun phrase, generally. It's a very common general idea. Um, the rest of the clause then is the ream, so which is so new information or informa new information about the thing you're talking about, and usually maybe information that you want to emphasize or highlight. So this concept of end weight, so that the important point you want to make and you want to stick in people's head is at the end of the uh, sentence. So the theme kind of primes the brain for the what's going to be said because it's known to the reader, to the reader or speaker, and then the ream will um, give that new information and, let, and make it easier for the uh, uh, person receiving the message to maybe grasp. So, and I think in these examples here, it's, you know, it's pretty clear. Um, so here, well, there's another feature here, but generally the, the maybe like, for example, in the first sentence, why you might have said B is because the most famous pyramids, it links to the idea of pyramids, which was given at the end of the previous sentence. So it's not new information, it's given a known information. And that's why it's put into the ream position. And um, if you had, it might be a little bit more challenging to comprehend if the sentence had been written as A, if A was the written sentence, because the people might, people might think, are you changing topic? Is this a new topic? And um, you get confused. Um, <clears throat> another comment there, um, Martin, yeah. the reference is another um, matter, you know, that if you've got one pronoun there, but what is the reference? So if the second, the, the choice of A and B is referring to something, and you're saying it's referring to some, uh, the the um, the ream, there will be in the ream, hmm. but it's also tricky for learners to realize what, what the pronoun is, where's, what's the reference pronoun, you know, what's the noun group that the reference pronoun oh, links to? That's a, yeah, so that like a number two here, yeah. like they, yes, is it is they like you might default to the pyramids in the previous or blocks of stone, yeah. So, so yeah, so I think, um, yes, I haven't talked too much about applications, just but that is a yeah, good point that the pronouns and where the pronouns refer back to which part of the previous uh, discourse they refer to. Uh, might need some yeah unpacking with learners. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, so I've I, I found this quote about why um, themes and reams are important, which I quite liked. Um, the communicate communication is the communication of new information into given, and the successful communicator as a person who correctly assesses the state of knowledge of their interlocutor. So if we misjudge and we treat what is new as given as new, it'll be boring. And But the reverse, and this is kind of the more problematic area, in the case where we assume the new to be given, so when you start um, a sentence with new inf information and assume the reader knows what you're talking about, it will be incomprehensible. Um, so I, I don't know if you're reading learner text, sometimes you you know, what are you talking about? Ideas seem to jump around and um, that seems to be uh, one of the reasons why. Um, just a tiny little bit of, in terms of grammar and themes. So as I was saying, generally in a normal declarative statement, uh, the subject of the clause is the theme. So there's a correlation between theme and subject. Um, <clears throat> and then that's the normal, so the unmarked, uh, verse um, form um, and then marked will be if you have any other thing that isn't maybe the subject in the theme position so if you want to emphasize something different it would be considered marked uh, but as a general rule you would have your um, generally the subject is in the theme position um, but that what is in the theme position depends on what is known to the reader or to the listener um, just in terms, though, of grammar implications of the theme and ream, 
concept uh, is that uh, I think was useful from this quote is that if low, low learn, level learners of English, if because of their limitation in control of grammatical features or structures, uh, they can struggle with um, in, like writing in a theme ream a meaningful way. Um, <clears throat> because often when you want to put information into the theme position, that you it might force you to have to choose a different type of grammatical structure, which you may not be, you may not know, or might be beyond your uh, re grammatical resources. Um, so, for example, some of the common, uh, some well, some areas of grammar that th th controlling theme and ream kind of requires learners to build. Um, some of the points, some grammar forms here, and I think the main one of the main ones is passives. Um, so if in this example here, uh, so some pyramids are made of more than two million blocks, and then so because blocks is the given information, uh, we want to put that into the theme position they. So we want to have they. So then we have to use the passive they were dragged into a place by team, a team of workers. Uh, but if, a, if, a, if a, a learner didn't have much control or knowledge of passives, they might write a sentence, no, because probably the vocabulary of this sentence is probably beyond them, but they probably would write a more active sentence like B, but then they would have lost the control of the theme and ream. They're, they would have, have created some uh, um, flow problems because their um, theme in B would be new information and not given information. So to, so to effectively control, to put um, given information at the beginning in the theme position, you know, learners do need to come to grips with passives um, structures to maintain that flow. Um, another language feature, which I think I even found a little bit uh, tricky, and I had to do, do a quick Google about, was ha having uh, prepositional phrases as subjects in the theme position. Um, so, for example, in this, uh, this extract here, uh, the pyramids were built to house the body of the pharaoh, and then, so because a seek in a, the secret chamber is new information, so you don't really want that in the theme position. You want it in the ream at the end of the sentence. So that means you need to start with something about the pyramid. And in A, inside each pyramid, so we've got a prepositional phrase as a subject, which is not very common. And so that might be confusing uh, for learners as well. Is everybody okay? And then the last um, type of grammatic, important grammatical area, I think the theme and ream uh, concept um, links with is the concept of nominalization or grammatical metaphor. And essentially this basically means taking uh, maybe a, um, uh, um, a, a process or some sort of active sentence structure with a verb in it and turning it into a noun or noun phrase. Um, so here is an example uh, here about hamburgers. I don't know if you can read that. And the underlined parts are demonstrate some nominalization where there's a noun or noun phrase summarizing a concept that's been discussed previously. <clears throat> Just find the chat. 
how oh my uh, my type what ah yeah we could just <laughs> type a comment on the <laughs> the type of fact <laughs> oh my gosh good to see what's that well spotted well spotted <laughs> Uh, high levels of facts, too true. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so I think so. I think the, I think the main point here is though, uh, when you are trying to maintain uh, this principle of putting um, given information in the theme position, you will often have to um, utilize a range of different grammar structures. And some of these structures may be unfamiliar, or depending on the level of your learners, there there's some structures that they may need to learn and become familiar with. And so you either have to draw attention to them or teach them. Is everyone okay about that? Um, so just a couple of other con aspects of theme and ream. So uh, to talk about uh, the next one is um, so there. There are different types of theme. The most important, well, the most important is, I think, the topical theme, which is the idea that you're talking about, the ideas, so the flow of ideas. So putting an idea in the um, uh, in, that is already known in the theme position. But in that, anything before the ream, sometimes you might put in other things to help guide the reader or to help re uh, respond or, uh, to the reader. So there's some examples here from Paltridge of different types of themes. Um, so the topical theme is the main, it's when you're talking about the ideas. Uh, and then the other team themes are either textual themes to kind of help guide the flow of information in the text, like co co um, cohesive devices or uh, linking words, and then interpersonal themes, which give more um, you know your attitude and relate to the reader or listener in, um, in terms of personal way so not really related to the to idea flow but other aspects to help make the ideas a little bit clearer to the reader and there's just this other example here Okay, is everyone okay with those concepts? <clears throat> um, so there are things, you know, I mean, maybe if, you know, people, well, I as well, looking for a theme, what's the theme, might get confused about when you see these different elements before the ream. Um, so you might have to raise learners awareness of these other elements that might be in this position before the ream. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the other aspect of theme and ream, which you've kind of touched upon, is the idea of got it here, uh, thematic progression. Um, so the idea of like how the themes moves through a text. Um, so if we went back here, um, so all of these examples here, so for example, in two, uh, we have, sorry, I'll go back to the first proper one here. Yeah just here, all of these examples, at the end of the sentence, you have an idea, a concept, like in number one, uh, pyramid. And then this idea is from taken from the end of the sentence that it was in, in the first sentence one, it was new information, but now it's being moved into sentence two at the beginning or theme position. So it's given information. So all of these sentences here, um, well, Sentence one and two and four tend to follow that pattern. Okay. Um, so it's hard, but the sentence three is a little bit different. Um, you have got pyramids in the theme position in, th in three and then also in three A. So this idea of, you know, how, what information is in the theme position and how it's carried on. Um, is uh, covered by the, con the idea of uh, thematic progression. Um, so, and there are different types of patterns of how, um, <clears throat> how the themes are continued or uh, moved through a text. 
So I'll just give you a few minutes just to read this example here. Is everybody okay? So we uh, the diagram below the theme is in, in the theme text, and the next sentence it, it's the same theme. It is a pronoun referring back to text, so it's the same concept. And then we have a new theme, discourse, and then the next it refers back to discourse. So this idea of repeating the theme, so the same theme from sentence to sentence, and so. Um, known as theme reiteration or constant theme. So it's just one, all it is, is a pattern. It's not saying that it is a good pattern or a bad pattern, it's just a pattern, okay? Um, the, and another common pattern uh, is um, this pattern, if you can see that. I'll give you another um, minute to read through that. Okay, so here is slightly different pattern, uh, a little bit more like many of the example sentences about the pyramid, where the, so you have a theme, and then that lead links to a new idea in the ream, and then the idea in the ream becomes the theme of the next sentence. So that idea of maintaining flow this way. And then obviously, then you have then longer stretches of text which mix all the mix patterns up and become a little bit more difficult to follow um, and uh, this is something like this and this i'll just give you a, a couple of minutes to look at that Okay, so I think this just illustrates, yes, when people are trying to communicate information, you know, they will, they have, uh, they have ideas about what they want to communicate. Um, so they will, there's not, it's not that you have to necessarily follow any particular pattern or progression, but it's maybe just to raise awareness among learners of these different patterns or progression uh, that they may come across and which may help them identify um, like I think as Yanni said earlier if they see reference like they it may help them think about where they should look to try and find what this referent is referring to um, but so this is probably more at a higher level uh, why thematic progression can be useful and that if you're examining how people uh, put forward their arguments or how they develop their arguments in a text, you might want to try and follow 
try and identify the theme ream progression to see how they are putting forward their um, idea arguments. And then there is some evidence that suggests that certain text types or genres, um, different patterns are a little bit more common in those type of text types or genres than maybe in others. Um, so, you know, like a, or in a, the methods section of a research article where this was done, then this was done, then this was done, then this was done, it might have a more constant theme progression, kind of mentioning the same, the same thing would be the theme position most of the way through, whereas the discussion, which is a little bit more like an argument, would have a more linear theme, ream, and then ream picked up into the next theme. But it's not a given. And so the very last concepts related to theme and ream, just to mention in terminology, is um, so we've talked about themes, but then the idea of hyper themes and macro themes. Um, and this may be with more um, with students writing longer texts, so maybe higher level of English and, and more ac my kind of like academic English. Um, so <clears throat> hyper themes essentially are so a theme is in the topic of the clause, so top, yeah, the topic of the clause, the given information, what the clause is about. Hyper themes kind of are more like topic sentences. So uh, a, a topic sentence which introduces the topic of a group of sentences. Um, so some definitions here. So it's just another way of either saying a topic sentence or of saying a um, kind of transitional sentences. So those type of sentences which capture the ideas that have become before and then you're indicating or are indicating what ideas are coming next in a group of sentences. So kind of at the paragraph level. <clears throat> and then at the whole text level is kind of the macro theme, which is a bit like an, an outline or overview of a, of a text. <clears throat> so. I think then there's just a couple of quotes just going to go through um, from a, a book, EAP Essentials, where they outline some of the key points about uh, kind of summarize um, theme and ream and theme and its importance. And I'll just go through those, which kind of summarizes the issue here. Key as aspects of thematic development. So readers need familiar. Uh, information in mind before they read something new about it. So theme first, given information. Familiar is usually, or given information is usually in the theme position of the sentence. Reams contain new information, which is temporarily the focus of attention. And I hold that, that's new. And then Detailed explanations or in complex phrases or clauses are easier to read if they're in the reams. And information in reams usually appear, reappears in a summary form later in the text, like this or this process or this problem uh, because it's moved into the background. And the movement of information from ream to theme links the developing text to what has gone before and helps to maintain the topic. Is everybody okay with that? So, um, so I, yeah, I wanted to talk about theme because I found it a really useful concept for helping, uh, well, yeah, for raising learners' awareness of features they need to create um, coherent and cohesive texts. Does anybody have any questions about that? No questions. Fantastic. All right, I'm just beginning to wonder, I wanted to move on to another topic uh, so I, in this session, I wasn't going to go into really much like about uh, um, 
practical applications or classroom activities. Uh, it's really just about introducing the concepts. And if we maybe we could something we could look at in a dive deep session. Um, I do want to go into um, one other. I was going to talk about one other thing, and I'm just wondering, will I have time about genre and genre analysis? Do people are people familiar with genre? Okay, so if people are a little bit familiar, so you have some inform information, um, I'll just see how much I can get through. Um, I, I won't rush through it, I'll just touch on some issues uh, about it. Um, I'm going to give you um, uh, another worksheet, okay, which has, you don't have to read it in detail, just glance over it. There's just, it talks about two approaches, approach one and give some examples and approach two and give some examples. And I just want you to think about uh, if you're familiar with those two different approaches about genre. Is that okay? Um, so I shall just, hopefully it'll be a bit smoother this time. Um, in the chat. Uh, oh, no. My, something has gone wrong with my, uh, my, my cursor. I'm frozen. Mm. Is everybody else okay? Or is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. Okay. I think we can hear you. Yeah, I, I froze. I'm every, I seem to freeze. Okay. Not sure what is going on there. Okay. All right. We can see it moving, Martin. Which? Your the, cursor. The, Even when it's frozen, we uh, can see it moving. I must have pressed something um, <laughs> I shouldn't have pressed. <laughs> OK, uh, I'll just give you a, so you should have got a worksheet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a bit overwhelming, <laughs> but if you can maybe look at it at a very high level, like view the texts that are about A and the approach A and texts about approach B, are they something that you see, approaches you've seen before, familiar with? Um, just if you just, just give you a minute to look, look over that. Okay, um, has anybody, are people familiar with those approaches? Some people, some not familiar? Well, okay, I might touch, about, touch upon them in a minute. You can share your ideas. Um, just first of all, just the idea of genre. Um, I just going to, this isn't a definition of genre, but it's kind of an explanation. Uh, some of the definitions, I think, are a bit, um, unless you read the full text, can be a little bit obtuse. And um, so I think this is uh, a good understanding of the concept of genre, that uh, text is not context-free, but part of a communicative event. So it's in a social, it has a clear purpose, and it's in a social context. Uh, uh, so like a recipe or um, an email to a colleague. So it is in a social context and aimed at particular people. Um, and this context uh, our event influences the content, uh, how you organize the information and the linguistic features. And that these features make the text identifiable as a genre. So when you see a, a recipe, you know it's a recipe. If an email 
from your colleague, you know it's an email from your colleague, that type of uh, idea, uh, so that they can become identifiable. So this text that you see is an example of a particular genre. And so genre is fulfilled communicative purpose in the event and it's understood by relevant discourse community. So just the idea that there are, um, so that a text uh, kind of has some constraints on it um, and that make it uh, imposed by the context and the purpose and that these kind of create similarities between texts who have a similar purpose or are produced in a similar context. Is that kind of okay? Um, so <clears throat> one of the biggest things <laughs> I have to say, I str have struggled with the genre for a long time and I still struggle with it sometimes in terms of about how to use the concept in class and what to do with it in terms of teaching. Um, so I'll just give you a, 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 one of the main reasons for some my initial um, confusion is just some of the terminology um, in different approaches. Um, so I think in the handout you've got there, there's the, the first approach kind of exemplifies more the uh, English for specific purposes approach to genre by swales. And then the second approach, to second extracts kind of um, give a bit of an insight into Sydney school approach to genre, which tends, to, so the tends to have been more aimed at um, primary and secondary school and also um, migrant uh, literacy education. And so for me, I think the biggest challenge has been, you know, what is a genre? Tell me what a genre is, you know, and the different approaches to that. Um, so, so in ESP, it tends to have been, people have kind of said a genre is anything, is a genre with people, if people who write it say that's the name of the genre. Well, that's the name of the genre. If it's a research article, that's the genre. If it's a report, it's a genre. If it's, you know, that's the genre is what people who write it in that community call it. Um, and so it's kind of like the everyday genre category. Uh, letter, email, newspaper. And so the, and then swales, so research article, term paper, final examination. So terms that are used in the discourse, the community of people who you write that text, uh, whatever they call it, that is the genre. Whereas on the other hand, um, people in uh, from the Sydney school have tried to go beyond the names in the context uh, of the sorry beyond the names given in the social context to look for more generic uh, communicative purpose and patterns within the text and um, so they've this is some things to, some names of genres here from the sydney school and um, so recount information report explanation exposition, discussion, procedure, narrative, news story. So they're not actually the names of things if somebody was writing something, what they might call it, you know, um, but they're the names of a genre where the texts that are examples or prototypes of that genre have this purpose, similar purpose, and have a similar schematic structure. So, I mean, I, I found I found this a little bit confusing for a while, just in terms of what, what to teach, what to show to students. I think the Sydney approach, because it's done through, uh, I don't know what, uh, people who are teaching primary and secondary schools here, is there, does that follow the Australian approach? Yeah. There is a mixed uptake. Um generally this the systemic functional linguistic um explanation and use of genre is quite heavily um layered into the pld now right and so there's the pluses and minuses about that because we have had trends of being quite fundamentalist and getting learners to learn a very 
um, predicted um, uh, tech structure mm. and to be, I suppose, moved away from being more fluid as writers. Um, I think the other aspect is that the reality of text, especially now that we're on the internet, is that there are small mixtures of all of these mm. in the interface of text that students read. And so that multi-generic nature of text is much more our reality now, especially if we're looking at the interface um, on, on, you know, on of digital, of the digital um, access that we have. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was reading a, an article that was saying that the, 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 Sydney School or SFL School ha that has expanded the view to kind of incorporate, look at genres at macro genres, like and how they piece together these type of genres within one longer or bigger piece of writing. Uh, so to try and cover that. And also, um, I think they've expanded the types of genres, the names of different types of genres, I think for to broaden it for secondary school. Um, as well, but they t all tend to be, um, they're yeah named these type of names, um, not, like not like the everyday genre name, like a report or essay, but these type of um, functional names. Um, it's a big well, yeah. It's a discussion. Uh, so, I think yeah, how you. So this is just the Sydney School and uh, uh, systemic function linguistic um, terminology, but which tends to be different from like the EAP or ESP approach. And the ESP approach tends to call things by their, whatever they're called within the discourse community, research article. And I think both, I think uh, are, both have issues. Um, one of the issues with the, um, I'm just going to skip on a few slides, but one of the issues with the EAP approach uh, is this idea here. So, so there was, <clears throat> I'll talk about this in a sec, but so there's Nessie and Gardner were trying to analyze university student genres and to categorize them. And they said that they, you know, they couldn't look at the names given by people in departments. Uh, because people in departments call everything, people in one department will call something a report, but then in another department, department it'll be called an essay. And so lecturers and academics use different, same terminology for different things and different terminology for the same thing. So sometimes using the names given by people in the community is problematic as well. Um, so in their approach, they um, went they kind of took adopted the approach of the sydney school in a way trying to identify by purpose and by structure uh, and create names that way to classify genres um so yes i haven't i haven't thought about this session in terms of practicalities at the moment but just in terms of raising awareness that this is something I struggle to get my head around a little bit, the different naming conventions for genres in these different approaches to genre and genre analysis and genre studies. Um, but one thing that they, all of the approaches, however they name it, they do have in common is uh, they do have, I was gonna go back, uh, sorry, oops, yeah. They just have functional patterns. They they really are trying to describe what are the you know how are the texts structured and to give and is there similar similarity in structures across uh, prototypes of that genre or texts which represent that genre. And uh, they just use slightly different terminology to describe these. So in the ESP they call them moves, and then moves are then. Uh, um, realized with steps kind of smaller so but it's all about functions what's the purpose of this section of text in terms of the overall function of the text and then how is that move realized by a smaller section of text and then in the um, sydney school they generally call them stages and then they've started to introduce other elements called phases 
Uh, but it really is, yes, I mean, you can be quite rigid about it, I suppose, or, um, and if you follow some of these approaches, you could be quite, have a very rigid approach, which could be a little bit, sorry, just gonna, so this is the Sydney School, so stages, and like this is from a procedure genre, the stages, which is the goal, and then the steps, you start off talking about what the goal is and the steps, but then you could have more defined aspects in some of the stages and they're called phases. So you might, and the, in the Sydney School, they say the phases are more variable and optional and there's a bit more choice about whether they're included or not or how they're included. They depend on the context. Um, in the EAP model, I think the most famous thing that always gets bandied about is this um, Swales, um, how research introductions and research articles are structured and uh, that you'll have the first move establishing um, I can't read my own, establishing a territory and then steps within that move. So um, what the writer is trying to do in order to establish a ter territory, establishing a niche and occupying a niche. So essentially, though, um, they're both of them are looking for kind of common rhetorical patterns or common um, sections within text which have a similar function or purpose um, and that represent that genre. Is everybody okay? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in re, uh, I suppose from, because I work in EA more in an EAP context, um, uh, there are, hmm, there's a little bit more, there's been a slight shift. So some of this, 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 this genre analysis, move analysis of text um, is trying to look for like um, very structure, just trying to see if there are um, very rigid patterns within a text or within a, a, a text, which is an example of a genre. Um, when often, in fact, a lot of genres that's well in university that people write are have very maybe some only a couple of parts are very common, like the introduction and the conclusion, but the main body could be quite uh, diverse and complicated uh, because it, it's related to the specific you know, topic that the lecturer wants them to cover. And so there has been a little bit of a shift away from such a conventionalized approach to move analysis. Do I have time to talk about this? Time's up. <laughs> no, I don't have time. Anyway, but and that's for another day, <laughs> another topic. Um, I will just say, so if you are in academic, teaching academic English, I think this book here, I'll just flip on, uh, this book here is quite useful um, about an approach for teaching a genre-inspired a genre approach. It's not uh, to helping university learners um, um, become familiar with uh, texts at university. Uh, it, obviously, it's not without, I'm sure it's up for debate and it's not without its issues, uh, but it's an approach uh, discussed. So I would recommend uh, reading that. So uh, skip, move on, move on. So, I guess, so next week, um, we are, planning on we are open to organizing a dive deep session um, and a dive deep is where you can explore some other concepts of uh, relate either explore some of the ideas here and um, that we've talked about in terms of genre and um, theme and uh, theme and uh, thematic analysis or also <clears throat> Yanni might lead a more uh, a session more focused on spoken discourse. Um, so what I'll do, if you are interested, we'll run it if there is interest. Um, so I'm just going to send, you should get a Google form. No, that is not the Google form. What is wrong with my, I'll get the Google form here now. Sometimes, okay. Yeah, so uh, just sent that Google form finally, and 
if you are interested in attending a dive deep session or if you want to indicate what area you'd like to focus on you can indicate it there and then we'll have a chat and, uh, and we'll the committee will have a chat and see what we'll how we'll organize the dive deep session uh, I, but i think we're provisionally scheduled it for next wednesday Okay, does anybody have any final questions or comments? I'll just say to everyone, um, I'm looking at spoken discourse, um, samples of uh, younger learners, um, spoken text, and really looking at overall teacher judgment. So not drilling down at the really deep grammatical level, but looking at trends across the the sample of what you want to be looking for and making judgments about and there are a couple of tools there that i'll share with you 